Sir Rudolf Ernst Peierls, German, Pals, the 5th of June 1907 to the 19th of September 1995, was a German physicist who played a major role in the Manhattan Project and Tube Alloys, Britain's nuclear program. His obituary in Physics Today described him as a major player in the drama of the eruption of nuclear physics into world affairs. Peierl studied physics at the University of Berlin, at the University of Munich under Arnold Sommerfeld, the University of Leipzig under Werner Heisenberg, and ETH Zurich under Wolfgang Pauli. After receiving his DPHIL from Leipzig in 1929, he became an assistant to Pauli in Zurich. In 1932, he was awarded a Rockefeller Fellowship, which he used to study in Rome under Enrico Fermi, and then at the Cavendish Laboratory at the University of Cambridge under Ralph H. Fowler. Due to Adolf Hitler's rise to power in Germany, he elected to not return home in 1933, but to remain in Britain, where he worked with Hans Bethe at the University of Manchester, then at the Mond Laboratory at Cambridge. In 1937, Mark Oliphant, the newly appointed Australian Professor of Physics at the University of Birmingham recruited him for a new chair there in Applied Mathematics. In March 1940, Peierls co-authored the Frisch Peierls Memorandum with Otto Robert Frisch. This short paper was the first to set out that one could construct an atomic bomb from a small amount of fissile uranium-235. Until then it had been assumed that such a bomb would require many tons of uranium, and consequently was impractical to build and use. The paper was pivotal in igniting the interest of first the British and later the American authorities in nuclear weapons. He was also responsible for the recruitment of his compatriot Klaus Fuchs to work on tube alloys, as the British Nuclear Weapons Project was called, which resulted in Peierls falling under suspicion when Fuchs was exposed as a spy for the Soviet Union in 1950. After the war, Peierls returned to the University of Birmingham, where he worked until 1963, and then was the Wycombe Professor of Physics at the University of Oxford until he retired in 1974. At Birmingham he worked on nuclear forces, scattering, quantum field theories, collective motion in nuclei, transport theory and statistical mechanics, and was a consultant to the Atomic Energy Research Establishment at Harwell. He received many awards, including a knighthood in 1968, and wrote several books including Quantum Theory of Solids, The Laws of Nature 1955, Surprises in Theoretical Physics 1979, More Surprises in Theoretical Physics 1991, and an autobiography, Bird of Passage 1985. Concerned with the nuclear weapons he had helped to unleash, he worked on the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, was president of the Atomic Scientists Association in the UK, and was involved in the Pugwash movement. <laughs> Early life Rudolf Ernst Peierls was born in the Berlin suburb of Oberschwanwied, the youngest of three children of Heinrich Peierls an electrical engineer who was the managing director of a cable factory of Allgemeine Elektrizitätsgesellschaft AEG, and his first wife Elisabeth May Weigert. Rudolf had an older brother, Alfred, and an older sister, Annie. His mother died from Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1921, and his father married Else Hermann, the sister-in-law of the playwright Ludwig Fulda. The family was Jewish, but assimilated, and Peierls and his siblings were baptized as Lutherans. When he came of age, Peierls left the church, Peierls commenced school a year late because he needed glasses, and his parents did not trust him not to lose them or break them. After two years at the local preparatory school, he entered his local gymnasium, the Humboldt Gymnasium, where he spent the next nine years, passing his abitur examinations in 1925. He wanted to study engineering, but his parents, who doubted his practical abilities, suggested physics instead. He entered the University of Berlin, where he listened to lectures by Max Planck, Walther Both, and Walther Nernst. Fellow students included Kurt Hirsch and Kate Sperling. The physics laboratory classes were overcrowded, so the first-year students were encouraged to take theoretical physics courses instead. Peierls found that he liked the subject. In 1926, Peierls decided to transfer to the University of Munich, where Arnold Sommerfeld, who was considered to be the greatest teacher of theoretical physics, was. Fellow students there included Hans Bethe, Hermann Bruck, and William V. Houston. At the time, the Bohr Sommerfeld theory was being overturned by the new quantum mechanics of Werner Heisenberg and Paul Dirac. In 1928, Sommerfeld set off on a world tour. 
On his advice, Peierls moved to the University of Leipzig, where Heisenberg had been appointed to a chair in 1927. Heisenberg set Peierls a research project on ferromagnetism. It was known that this was caused by the spin of the electrons in the metal aligning, but the reason for this was unknown. Heisenberg suspected that it was caused by a quantum mechanical effect, caused by the Pauli exclusion principle. Peierls was unable to develop the theory, but work on Hall effect was more productive. The anomalous Hall effect could not be explained with the classical theory of metals, and Heisenberg sensed an opportunity to demonstrate that quantum mechanics could explain it. Peierls was able to do so, resulting in his first published paper. Heisenberg left in 1929 to lecture in America, China, Japan, and India, and on his recommendation, Peierls moved on to ETH Zurich, where he studied under Wolfgang Pauli. Pauli set him a problem of investigating the vibration of atoms in a crystal lattice. Peierls explored and named the phenomenon of umclap scattering. He submitted this work as his DPHIL thesis, Zur Kinetischen Theorie der Warmeleitung in Kristallen on the kinetic theory of heat conduction in crystals, which was accepted by the University of Leipzig in 1929. His theory made specific predictions of the behavior of metals at very low temperatures, but another 20 years would pass before the techniques were developed to confirm them experimentally. <laughs> Early career Peierls accepted an offer from Pauli to become his assistant vice Felix Bloch. Lev Landau was there at this time on a scholarship from the government of the Soviet Union, and Peierls and Landau became friends. They collaborated on deriving a series of wave equations similar to the Schrödinger equation for photons. Unfortunately, their equations, while complicated, were nonsensical. In 1930, Peierls traveled to the Netherlands to meet Hans Kramers, and to Copenhagen to meet Niels Bohr. In August 1930, Pauli and Peierls attended a physics congress in Odessa and met a young physics graduate, Eugenia Genia Nikolaevna Kanagiser, who, like Landau, came from Leningrad. Since he did not speak Russian and she did not speak German, they conversed in English. During a subsequent visit by Peierls to lecture in Leningrad, they were married on 15 March 1931. However, she had to wait for a passport and exit visa. They finally left for Zurich that summer. They had four children, Gabby Ellen B. Ronald Frank B. Catherine Kitty B. and Joanna B. Peierls assisted Egan Oroen in understanding the force required to move a dislocation which would be expanded on by Frank Nabarro and called the Peierls Nabarro Force. In 1929, he studied solid-state physics in Zurich under the tutelage of Heisenberg and Pauli. His early work on quantum physics led to the theory of positive carriers to explain the thermal and electrical conductivity behaviors of semiconductors. He was a pioneer of the concept of holes in semiconductors. He established zones. Before Leon Brillouin, despite Brillouin's name being currently attached to the idea, and applied it to phonons. Doing this, he discovered the Boltzmann equations for phonons and the umclap process. He submitted a paper on the subject for his habilitation, acquiring the right to teach at German universities. Physics Today noted that, "...his many papers on electrons in metals have now passed so deeply into the literature that it is hard to identify his contribution to conductivity in magnetic fields and to the concept of a hole in the theory of electrons in solids." Topic. Academic in exile In 1932, Peierls was awarded a Rockefeller Fellowship to study abroad, which he used to study in Rome under Enrico Fermi, and then at the Cavendish Laboratory at the University of Cambridge in England under Ralph H. Fowler. In Rome, Peierls completed two papers on electronic band structure, in which he introduced the Peierls substitution, and derived a general expression for demagnetism in metals at low temperatures. This provided an explanation of the hitherto mysterious properties of bismuth, in which demagnetic properties were more pronounced than in other metals. Due to Adolf Hitler's rise to power in Germany, he elected to not return home in 1933, but to remain in Britain. He declined an offer from Otto Stern of a position at the University of Hamburg, granted leave to remain in Britain. He worked at the University of Manchester with funding from the Academic Assistance Council, which had been set up to help academic refugees from Germany and other fascist countries. 
Most of his immediate family also left Germany, his brother and his family settling in Britain, and his sister and her family, along with his father and stepmother, moved to the United States, where his uncle Siegfried lived. Peierls collaborated with Beta on photodisintegration and the statistical mechanics of alloys when challenged by James Chadwick. Their results still serve as the basis for mean field theories of structural phase changes in complete alloys. Although most of his work continued to be about the electron theory of metals, he also looked at Dirac's hole theory, and co-wrote a paper with Beta on the neutrino. The University of Manchester awarded him a DSC. degree. Moving back to Cambridge, he worked with David Schoenberg at the Mond Laboratory on superconductivity and liquid helium. To allow him to lecture, in accordance with its rules, St. John's College, Cambridge, awarded him an ex officio MA degree. In 1936, Mark Oliphant was appointed the Professor of Physics at the University of Birmingham, and he approached Peierls about a new chair in applied mathematics that he was creating there, applied mathematics being what would today be called theoretical physics. Peierls got the job despite competition from Harry Massey and Harry Jones. The appointment at last gave Peierls a secure, permanent position. His students included Fred Hoyle and P. L. Kapper, a student from India. With Kapper he derived the dispersion formula for nuclear reactions originally given in perturbation theory by Gregory Breit and Eugene Wigner, but now included generalizing conditions. This is now known as the kapper perils derivation. It is still used, but in 1947 Wigner and Leonard Eisenbud developed a more widely used alternative method. In 1938, Peierls paid visits to Copenhagen, where he collaborated with Bohr and George Placek on a paper on what is now known as the bohr peierls placek relation. The Second World War broke out before it could be published, but drafts were circulated for comment, and it became one of the most cited unpublished papers of all time. Topic. Second World War Topic. Frisch Peierls Memorandum After the outbreak of the Second World War in September 1939, Peierls started working on nuclear weapons research with Otto Robert Frisch, a fellow refugee from Germany. Ironically, they were excluded from the work on radar at the University of Birmingham because it was considered too secret for scientists who were enemy aliens. Peierls was naturalized as a British subject on 27 March 1940. He was eager to participate in the fight against fascism and militarism, but the only organization that would accept him was the Auxiliary Fire Service. He accepted an offer from the University of Toronto to send his two children to live with a family in Canada. In February and March 1940, Peierls and Frisch co authored the Frisch Peierls Memorandum, which Peierls typed. This short paper was the first to establish that an atomic bomb could be created from a small amount of fissile uranium 235. Based on the information at hand, they calculated that less than 1 kg would be required. The true figure for the critical mass is about four times as large, but until then it had been assumed that such a bomb would require many tons of uranium, and consequently was impractical to build and use. They went on to estimate the size of the explosion, and its physical, military and political effects. The Frisch Perils Memorandum was pivotal in igniting the interest of first the British and later the American authorities in atomic weapons. In 1941 its findings made their way to the United States through the report of the MOD Committee, an important trigger in the establishment of the Manhattan Project and the subsequent development of the atomic bomb. With the Frisch Perils Memorandum and the MOD Committee report, the British and American scientists were able to begin thinking about how to create a bomb, not whether it was possible. As enemy aliens, Frisch and Perils were initially excluded from the MOD Committee, but the absurdity of this was soon recognized, and they were made members of its technical subcommittee. This did not mean that they were cleared for radar work. When Oliphant made the services of his secretary available for typing up the payrolls and Frisch's papers for the MOD committee in September 1940, they were not allowed to enter the Nuffield building where she worked, so Peierls submitted them for typing by dictaphone on wax cylinders. Frisch and Peierls thought at first that uranium enrichment was best achieved though thermal diffusion, but as the difficulties with this approach became more apparent they switched to gaseous diffusion, bringing in a fellow refugee from Germany, Franz Simon, as an expert on the subject. Peierls also recruited yet another refugee from Germany, Klaus Fuchs, as his assistant in May 1941. Topic. Manhattan Project 
As a result of the MOD Committee's findings, a new directorate known as Tube Alloys was created to coordinate the nuclear weapons development effort. Sir John Anderson, the Lord President of the Council, became the minister responsible, and Wallace Akers from Imperial Chemical Industries was appointed the director of Tube Alloys. Payrolls, Chadwick and Simon were appointed to its technical committee, which was chaired by Akers. Its first meeting, in November 1941, was attended by two American visitors, Harold Urey and George B. Pegram. Later that year, Payrolls flew to the United States, where he visited Urey and Fermi in New York, Arthur H. Compton in Chicago, Robert Oppenheimer in Berkeley, and Jesse Beams in Charlottesville, Virginia. When George Kistiakowski argued that a nuclear weapon would do little damage as most of the energy would be expended heating the air, Payrolls, Fuchs, Jeffrey Taylor and J. G. Kinch worked out the hydrodynamics to refute this. The signing of the Quebec Agreement on 19 August 1943 merged tube alloys with the Manhattan Project. Akers had already cabled London with instructions that Chadwick, Payrolls, Oliphant and Simon should leave immediately for North America to join the British mission to the Manhattan Project, and they arrived the day the agreement was signed. Simon and Payrolls were attached to the Kellex Corporation, which was engaged in the K-25 project, designing and building the American gaseous diffusion plant. While Kellex was located in the Woolworth Building, Payrolls, Simon and Nicholas Curdy had their offices in the British supply mission on Wall Street. They were joined there by Tony Skyrme and Frank Kirton, who arrived in March 1944. Curdy returned to England in April 1944 and Kirton in September. Payrolls moved on to the Los Alamos Laboratory in February 1944, Skyrme followed in July, and Fuchs in August. At Los Alamos, the British mission was fully integrated into the laboratory, and British scientists worked in most of its divisions, only being excluded from plutonium chemistry and metallurgy. When Oppenheimer appointed Beta as the head of the laboratory's prestigious theoretical T division, he offended Edward Teller, who was given his own group, tasked with investigating Teller's super bomb. Oppenheimer then wrote to the director of the Manhattan Project, Brigadier General Leslie R. Groves, Jr., requesting that payrolls be sent to take Teller's place in T division. Payrolls arrived from New York on 8 February 1944, and subsequently succeeded Chadwick as head of the British mission at Los Alamos. Payrolls also became leader of T1 implosion group, and so was responsible for the design of the explosive lenses used in the implosion-type nuclear weapon to focus an explosion onto a spherical shape. He sent regular reports to Chadwick, the head of the British mission to the Manhattan Project, in Washington, D.C. When Groves found out, he asked Payrolls to send him reports too. Payrolls was one of those present at the Trinity nuclear test on 16 July 1945. He returned to England in January 1946. For his services to the Nuclear Weapons Project, he was appointed a commander of the Order of the British Empire in the 1946 New Year Honours, and was awarded the U.S. Medal of Freedom with Silver Palm in 1946. Topic. Espionage Payrolls was responsible for the recruitment of Fuchs to the British project, an action which was to result in Payrolls falling under suspicion when Fuchs was exposed as a Soviet spy in 1950. In 1999, The Spectator garnered outrage from Payrolls's family when it published an article by journalist Nicholas Farrell that alleged that Payrolls was a spy for the Soviet Union. The article was based on information supplied by intelligence historian Nigel West, who identified Payrolls as the spy codenamed Fogel, and later Purs, in the Venona Intercepts, and his wife Genia as the spy codenamed Tina. However, the association of Tina with Genia did not fit with what was known about Tina, and she was conclusively revealed to be Melita Norwood in 1999. Nor did Payrolls fit Purs, as the latter worked at the Clinton Engineer Works, whereas Payrolls did not. There were good reasons for the post-war intelligence agencies to suspect Payrolls. He had not only recruited Fuchs, and served as his sponsor on recruitment and security matters, but had pressed the authorities for Fuchs to be given a full security clearance without which he could not have assisted Payrolls in his work. Fuchs lived with the Payrolls family for a time. Payrolls had a Russian wife, as did his brother, and he maintained close contact with colleagues in the Soviet Union before and after the Second World War. While not a communist like Fuchs, Payrolls was known to have left-wing political views, and had colleagues with similar views. He was denied a visa to visit the United States to attend a nuclear physics conference in Chicago in 1951. 
A similar request the following year was granted, but in 1957 the Americans expressed concerns about him, indicating that they were unwilling to share information with the Atomic Energy Research Establishment at Harwell while he remained as a consultant. Post-war Physicists were in demand after the war, and Perils received offers from several universities. He seriously considered an offer of a position at Cambridge from William Lawrence Bragg, but decided to return to Birmingham. He worked on nuclear forces, scattering, quantum field theories, collective motion in nuclei, transport theory, and statistical mechanics. Peierls had largely left solid-state physics behind when, in 1953, he began collecting his lecture notes on the subject into a book. Reconsidering the way that the atoms in metal crystals are arranged, he noted an instability. This became known as the Peierls transition. Peierls built up the physics department at Birmingham by attracting high-quality researchers. These included Gerald E. Brown, Max Crook, Tony Skyrme, Dick Dalitz, Freeman Dyson, Luigi Arialdo Radicati di Brozolo, Stuart Butler, Walter Marshall, Stanley Mandelstam and Elliot H. Lieb. An undergraduate school of mathematical physics was created. Peierls delivered the lectures on quantum mechanics, a subject that had not been taught at Birmingham before the war. In 1946 Peierls became a consultant to the Atomic Energy Research Establishment at Harwell. After Fuchs was dismissed from his position there as head of the Theoretical Physics Division in 1950, Maurice Price acted in the position in a part-time capacity, but when he went to America for a year on sabbatical, Peierls took his place. The position was finally filled permanently by Brian Flowers. Peierls resigned from Harwell in 1957 due to what he saw as a lack of openness in security vetting at the request of the Americans, which he felt indicated a lack of trust in him on the part of senior staff, but he was invited to rejoin in 1960, and did so in 1963, remaining as a consultant for another 30 years. Peierls became the Wycombe Professor of Physics at the University of Oxford in 1963. He remained there until he retired in 1974. He wrote several books including Quantum Theory of Solids 1955, The Laws of Nature 1955, Surprises in Theoretical Physics 1979, More Surprises in Theoretical Physics 1991, and an autobiography, Bird of Passage 1985. Concerned with the nuclear weapons he had helped to unleash, he worked on the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, was president of the Atomic Scientists Association in the UK, and was involved in the Pugwash movement, and Freeze, now known as Saferworld, Genia died on 26 October 1986. Peierls remained active, although his eyesight deteriorated. In 1994, he suffered a combination of health problems, including heart, kidney and lung problems, and relocated himself to Oakenholt, a nursing home near Farmore, Oxfordshire. He liked to read scientific papers in enlarged script on a computer screen. During 1995, his health continued to decline, and he required regular kidney dialysis sessions at Churchill Hospital, where he died on 19 September 1995. Honours Peierls was knighted in the 1968 Birthday Honours. He was awarded the Rutherford Memorial Medal in 1952, the Royal Medal in 1959, the Lorentz Medal in 1962, the Max Planck Medal in 1963, the Guthrie Medal and Prize in 1968, the Matucci Medal in 1982, and the Enrico Fermi Award from the United States Government for Exceptional Contribution to the Science of Atomic Energy in 1980. In 1986, he was awarded the Copley Medal, and delivered the Rutherford Memorial Lecture, and in 1991 he was awarded the Dirac Medal and Prize. On 2 October 2004, the building housing the sub-department of theoretical physics at the University of Oxford was formally named the Sir Rudolf Peierls Centre for Theoretical Physics. Notes References External links 1979 audio interview with Sir Rudolf Peierls by Martin Sherwin Voices of the Manhattan Project Portraits in the National Portrait Gallery, London. Rudolf Peierls' own biographical notes from Los Alamos National Laboratory as a PDF at the Wayback Machine archived September 2012. 
War and Peace in the Nuclear Age, Don, Interview with Rudolf Peierls, 1986 FBI File on Rudolf and Eugenia Peierls O'Connor, John J., Robertson, Edmund F. Rudolf Peierls. MacTutor History of Mathematics Archive, University of St. Andrews. Rudolf Peierls at the Mathematics Genealogy Project.